neither, none of my family ever been to university, and nor had anybody in our school been to a college before, so we were pioneers in our simple sit-cup at Chislehurst and Sidcup County Grammar School for Girls. And when people say today, it's so strange, people of first generation university, well, everybody was in my days, I can remember. My background was at a girls, independent girls' school in Suffolk, St. Felix, and um, I came straight on from there to Oxford. My father was at Cambridge and objected to my being at Oxford. <laughs> I got an exhibition, and then, as, because we had then state scholarships as well, so I think everything was paid for from the word go, but I'm not absolutely sure. We were very hard up, so I know we hadn't any money. I went to Lady Ellen Hollis School on a scholarship um, in Middlesex Free Place. I came from a working class family. My father worked on the railways. He'd left school at 13. My mother had had some secondary education. She left school at about 16, having had some secretarial training and got a, quite a nice job in an estate agent. And she was ambitious for her children, and she went out to work when I was about 11 or 12, so that there was the money to pay for my uniform and things for school. The entrance exams were interesting, and I remember writing an essay which I really enjoyed on is there such a thing as scientific method in history, which I thought was a brilliant subject. And, um, but when I got to the interview, I think I was fairly nervous, I don't know. Um, I can't remember too much about it, because it is a long time ago. And we had interviews with both, I think, with Mrs. Prestwich and Beryl Smalley. I actually got into LMH first, and then got the exhibition to St. Hilda's. Two, two teachers who were very keen that we should try, because my friend Margaret Gelling was also a fellow of the college. Um, she came up with me, so the two of us, in the end, got to St. Hilda's. But it was um, a pioneering gesture, gesture in a way, and there's was the teachers encouraging us, really. I don't think my parents were all that bothered about it. I was lucky, I got what's called a London County Council Teachers Scholarship, because I was going to teach. And that paid everything. And I didn't have to pay any tuition fees or the residents, anything like that. The LCC paid for the lot. In my generation were told by their schools what they should do, and we weren't asked. I mean, I was told I was sitting in Oxford exams, entrance exams next week, you know, just go and do it. Although I got an interview at St Hilda's, I didn't get a place, but they wrote an encouraging letter and said, you, you, we think you have a good chance if you apply again next year, which is what I did, and was very pleased to be awarded a place. College life was very nice and very luxurious, I think. We had, because I was in college all the time, I was never out. That's because I was secretary of the JCR. There were about 60 of us each year, so there were only 180 altogether. And so we all ate in for most meals. Um, I mean, some people would miss out on hall and go and um, do scrambled eggs in their rooms, and, or at least in the, the little moabs, and leave their horrible scrambled egg saucepans lying about. <laughs> there were always some. The scientists on the whole live a slightly different life from the arts people because we always had nine o'clock lectures. So we were all down to breakfast promptly at eight o'clock and uh, whereas the, the arts people came drifting down about quarter to nine and with any luck we'd saved them some toast. The meals were delicious and you know it just was lovely and we had friends and we could do anything except be out after 11 o'clock at night. You were signed out that you weren't, weren't in after supper, you had to sign out in a, in a book and if you came in after 11 that was sixpence but if you hadn't signed at all when you got in and the porter found you hadn't signed that was a shilling that's big money, of course, when you hadn't got any money. And then you went in, you put on your gown and went to the principal's room over in South um, Building and you paid your to find the her person. Oh, that was careless, wasn't it? She'd say, thank you, Miss Mabs, that was it. Off she went. There was really nice, friendly proceeding going to have your fine, pay your fine. They could come to lunch on Sundays. Um, there were, you had to book it in advance. But um, no, men had to be out by seven. At least they were supposed to be. The thing I want to stress is that in our day, it was the academic side that really attracted you and the, the beauty of Oxford and the dons you might have teaching you, the best teachers you would have in the tutorial system. And when I hear about all the social life they had today, I think, well, it didn't, I didn't go for social life. It was a complete waste of time. I didn't want to do any of that, um, nor, had, nor, nor could you, because I was up during the war, you see. And no one was minded to waste their time in that way, but we did put the, the work and the scholarship first. You had three essays a fortnight and um, you had tutorials in college if, if your part of the subject was being 
taught by one of the tutors in UB in college. Otherwise, you went out to college. I went to Merton, to Lawrence Stone, I think. And that was what was so joyful, because you saw very famous people like Professor Poick, who used to um, stand and sway as he was teaching, and he brought his handkerchief out of his gown and wiped his hose and then put it back again. He had all sorts of mannerisms, and he was great fun, but a great medievalist. I've still got his books, so he wrote some very good things on church history. As a scientist, we had one tutorial with our um, subject tutor a week, and we wrote one essay a week. And then we had two lectures every morning, including Saturdays. Um, and also, as scientists, we had to pass, or chemists, we had to pass a qualifying examination in German or Russian. A lot of the research papers in those days uh, were written in German. And so you were supposed to be able to consult them in the original language. And of course, there was no Google to do Google Translate. <laughs> You could take a degree in Oxford, you couldn't in Cambridge, but, but you were very much a minority group. But no one, that wasn't stressed in the, in the um, tutorials or in the lectures. It was, there was a sort of thing, St. St Anne's, I can't remember what they were, LMH was the clever one. No, Somerville was the clever ones, Lady Margaret Hall was the aristocracy, the snobs, so to speak, and St Hilda's was bring out your girls, was St Hilda's. And St Hugh's was sport, I think. I can't remember St Anne's. There was one college don who wouldn't have women in his lectures, somebody at Christchurch, I think. He made a rule about it, but he was the only one I ever heard of that wouldn't have women coming to his lectures. Um, we were over the bridge, so we weren't quite in the centre of things, as some of the others were. But, um, I mean, we had societies where... I mean, you met men outside college, and because they had no women in their own colleges. Of course, they were quite keen to uh, involve us in their activities, like sing. I mean, I did quite a lot of singing and um, things like that. And apart from the union, most societies were mixed. We went to lots of societies. I mean, Cosmos Society, and I went to the University Labour Club, and we went to um, so 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 Socratic Society with all discussions. Um, and every Sunday night, you could go to Balliol, put on your gown, and sit on the, t the dining table. Have a lovely concert. They had all sorts of people playing to us. My dance life was what I really wanted to do, and which I am doing now, and have done for 30 years more, more than 30 years. And so when I realised that there wasn't much dance anywhere in Oxford that I wanted, I took ballet lessons at Miss Pigeon's Dance School in Hollywell with two people who became men, who became dance critics of the... Times, I think, and I can't remember the other one, Telegraph probably. But I did have the fortune to listen to Tamara Kasavina, who was a very famous Russian ballet dancer, and she inspired me so much. I, I sort of knew that dance was the track I really was on. And so I did get the job of cho choreographing for Ouds and for The Tempest, which was performed in front of Worcester College Lake. It was a very historic performance. Neville Coghill, you probably won't have heard of, but he was a, a theatre director in London. And I loved working with him, he was wonderful. Neville, and we had some very good actors, people who've gone on in, da in uh, drama since. Well, you were very conscious that you were a privileged group because other people, and one or two of my year, had to do two years only and then go into the army or the air force or whatever. But because I was going to be a teacher, they gave me the chance of doing um, three years and no diploma or two years with a teaching diploma, and I chose to do the three years. And then, by the mercy of God, the war ended, and I did the diploma as well, so I was lucky. But that was what you had a truncated course, I think, all the way through. And some of the colleges weren't, weren't used. St. Hughes was a, a depot for the Red Cross, I think. It wasn't used for the undergraduates. No bombs, of course. We took the war very seriously, though. We had syrup pump teams, and I was an air raid war with a tin hat, and. We took it all quite seriously, and we had air raid practices, though the nearest bomb was at Whitney, and that was seven miles away from Oxford, that's the nearest it ever got to us. In those days, you couldn't be in a punt during the day unless you passed your punting test, and you went out with the boats committee before breakfast and practiced punting on the ISIS, on the Charwell, one of those places, and it was lovely. And once you learned to punt, that was a great skill. And of course, in, when they, because you remember, we were up during the time of the blackout, so when you cycled around Oxford at night, it was totally dark. And um, the, the high street was full of American tanks, were zooming up and down, getting in your way when you were cycling. 
And when they were on the river, they were in um, canoes, and they thought it was a great game to push their canoe against our punt, but of course, they came off worse because the punt was more stable. So a lot of American soldiers languished in the River Charwell because they bumped into us. It was 1948, so the war was over th for three years, and we therefore had a lot of um, people who just left the army or the forces in one way or another. And that was very nice for us because we had lots of slightly older boyfriends. <laughs> they probably got into university before the war, and then, well, during the war, and then had to go and fight or whatever, and then came and did their degrees. I think the biggest issue was, shall we take the Daily Worker? It used to come up regularly <laughs> because we took the Telegraph and so that the one girl who was a communist said, well, in that case, you must take the Daily Worker. And we had arguments every term about whether we should subscribe to the Daily Worker. <laughs> I didn't have a radio, so I was often very unaware of what was going on. I do remember a meeting being called when the Hungarian uprising happened. And I remember, I think it was Khrushchev, being on the steps of the town hall and going to see him there. And also, you know how you see those lovely sunsets out of the end wall of um, uh, Old Hall building? During the atomic tests, they were absolutely superb, but we were aware of why they were. And that was, I suppose, in the background. Um... I had two curriculum vitae. One was the dance one, and one was the non-dance one. So I went straight to the BBC because I had to earn money quickly. And after three years, I, I was in school broadcasting and news information. And um, in school broadcasting, I wrote myself and I thought I'd better go and take a PGC. So then I was teaching in schools and further education and also at the College of Technology, Oxford College of Technology, for quite a long time. And then my father, who I was looking after and you know, supporting, he died. And so then somebody gave me a leaflet about dance and I grabbed it and it said, Teachers can go on this course to train to teach dance. And I thought, that's me then, I'm going. And um, so that's when the dance started. It was uh, 1968. And uh, I took the course at the Laban Center, where after a year I was considered qualified to teach dance to adults. So I started to do that. And I was teaching in, in adult education then. Well, then I took this chance to go to Romania to study folk dance while I was teaching in a secondary a comprehensive school. And um, after a couple of years, I went, I got, I decided to go to Paris. So I went all over Paris looking at dance classes and stumbled upon the school which I'm still with, which is called La Danse d'Expression Chantraine, the Dance of Expression Chantraine. And I've stayed with them ever since. I've set up a school in London on their behalf. That's what I'm doing now. I go and train all the time, even now. I taught three classes this morning. <laughs> My, my husband-to-be and I shared the gramophone records and the record player and it gradually got closer and closer and at, um, after the degree ceremony from which my parents had come up, I, the mum, my, I said, look mum, <laughs> I've never seen my mother look so surprised <laughs> then or now <laughs> since. I went for the careers interviews in the end of the fourth year. I remember going to ESSO and they said at the outset that women would be paid a fifth less than the men. I didn't bother with that, so... <laughs> I, I applied and got my own job. Um, I started off as a research assistant at Mayon Baker in Dagenham. Um, then we got married, um, had a family. We moved south, and I thought I'd train as a teacher. I, I couldn't go back to research. I hadn't enjoyed it very much. and. Um, it didn't fit in with having a family, really. So I thought, yeah, OK, I'll train as a teacher. And I had a phone call from the lady whose house we'd bought saying, they're looking for somebody to come and teach for a fortnight at um, Chatham Grammar. And 13 years later, <laughs> I'd, got, I'd reached full time and was full mistress and was fully involved. And then um, I'd also been running the school bookshop. And the proprietor of the local bookshop from whom I'd been getting the stock asked me if I'd like to come and manage his bookshop. And 15 years later, that's what I'd been doing. <laughs> One of the things I have subsequently done is write, and I completed a biography of a chap, um, which was I published. I've now been forced to take on the editorship of the parish magazine, and I'm enjoying that too. <laughs> so I've never really retired yet. <laughs> well, I was lucky. I got a job in teaching in Preston for my first school. 
and the headmistress there was historians, and that was rather fun because she was a JP and I visited Preston Prison and did all sorts of things. I was lucky, I went from there to the school where I did my teaching practice, which was in um, Kent, Bromley, and I'd been there for teaching practice. And the head of history, she left fairly suddenly, and there they were stuck with no head of history, and they applied and advertised for the job, and nobody really applied. And in the end, they thought, what about me? So I was very lucky. At the age of 25, I was head of, head of history department in the lovely school. Because I couldn't be a priest, I felt I must be the most pastoral kind of teacher I can be and get to know children's problems and try and help them. Miss Mann, our principal, belonged to a society called the Society for Equal Ministry of Men and Women in the Church, a very sober, sort of august sort of a group of people, and she was a treasurer. And she said to me, if you want to be ordained, she said, you ought to be in our club, you ought to be in our society. So I joined this in 1942, and mildly was campaigning from 1942 to 1992, when we finally won the vote. It took ever such a long time to go through Parliament, and I remember my lo local MP, Peter Bottomley, gave me all the um, Hansard um, copies, so I knew all the speeches that they made about it. So it was a long time before it got through Parliament, and the Queen finally signed it. So none of us was ordained until 1994. And the first ones were in March in Bristol, and we were in May in Southwark, where I was. And there were 78 of us that all day in that particular day. All our campaigning had suddenly come to fruition, and there we were, all, all priests in 1994. So I was a Sunday school teacher, a reader, a de deaconess, a deacon, and then a priest. So I've been through the whole system. <laughs> The best thing was the opportunities. I mean, I'd left a, led a pretty sheltered life. So there was a theater, there were cinemas, there was every society under the sun, whatever you were interested in. I didn't have an Oxford degree because very rare you see in those days. We were we were a pioneer pioneer group really. enriched my whole life, undoubtedly, and I'm indebted to St Hilda's. It's extraordinary what it's done for me.